Wait a minute. What's up, ladies and gents, and welcome back to another episode of the Birdie Num Num Podcast. Sanjay Manangtala here, and I do apologize. It has been so long. I know the last time I posted an episode, I said I'm going to get right back into it, but you know... COVID and self-discovery and moving to the U.S. and uh, a million other things happening in my life uh, that kind of got me distracted and sidetracked. But, uh, you know, I'm back hopefully for good this time. So let's get right into it, shall we? Because we have a nice open dialogue, you and I, uh, every well, not every week uh, recently, but hopefully every week. Um, so I thank you, uh, dear listener, for coming back. Um, and I do want to talk about something that I was thinking about, and I, I promise you I'm going to be talking about this sort of stuff a lot more. And that is, of course, I'm sure many of you, you know, this is the Birdie Num Num podcast trying to inspire creativity and free thinking and self-discovery and a million other things that the middle class person or daisy person or any person might be dealing with. And recently, I started to notice uh, here in California, or sorry, not in California. By the way, I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, because my wife uh, has gotten a job here, God bless her, uh, doing what she loves to do, which is radiology. And the odds of that happening for a, uh, you know, IMG, as they call it, an Indian graduate, uh, you know, are very difficult uh, to kind of do it all over again. But she made it happen. Uh, she's a rock star. So we are here. I am here being the supportive husband, trying to start over and do things here in Tennessee. So um, it's good to be here. And I was thinking, you know, recently I noticed on YouTube that uh, they removed the dislike button. And, you know, oftentimes when I started doing YouTube, for those of you who have followed me for a while, uh, you may know in the early days uh, of YouTube, it was very important to have good metrics, right? Like a good like to dislike ratio. I mean, what do we all do? Earlier, we would check how many views the video have to determine if we want to watch it. Even before that, it was, oh, you know, some bikini shot or some thumbnail clickbait that would get us to be enticed. And then we got smarter. And then we looked and I used to use a very cool plugin uh, on the internet called vidIQ, which no longer works. But basically what that would do is it would give you the like to dislike ratio on videos. So for example, you know, like if a video had 5,000 um, likes and 5,000 dislikes, then it would say 50%, you know, which is horrible for a video on YouTube. But if it's at like 99% and it had like 99,000 likes and like 1,000 dislikes, you know, okay, that's the tutorial I want to watch or that's the comedy clip I should watch or whatnot. And so, you know, YouTube uh, removed that recently. And the reason they did that, or they say is, um, you know, they wanted to protect people from getting trolled. They wanted to protect people from getting their feelings hurt and, you know, kind of dislike bombing, um, if you will. Like if there was a bunch of fake news, fake news, that's my Trump impression. <laughs> but, you know, and I was all for stuff like that earlier on. And I get it. You know, the Internet is a cruel place and I have been trolled merc mercilessly. Uh, oftentimes when my stand-up comedy clips are going around in India because people didn't get my accent or they didn't understand the humor I was trying to do, which is fine. You know, you put yourself out there. You have to be open to criticism. I always welcome it as long as it's constructive. And even if it's not, I'm like, all right, well, what can I do better? You know, how can, if you want to play in this arena, you know, you got to learn how to be likable um, and how to do things to kind of not cater to your audience or pander to your audience, but how to at least, we all have room to improve. You know, nobody is is perfect from the start. So even if you are a 10 out of 10 supermodel and with a bunch of personality, you know, like I tell female comics this all the time, and this is going to sound very off, but um, I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but you know, even girls agree, it's tough to be a very attractive female stand-up comedian because, you know, most comics are, you know, there's something wrong about us. We're either depressed or mopey or chubby or, you know, girls don't like me or this or that. And so the audience kind of feels like, okay, they get the self-deprecating humor. But if you're like a supermodel trying to do stand-up comedy, it's hard to empathize with you because we all think your life is perfect. So when you complain about the world, you know, it's like boo-hoo, good for you, right? And I've noticed this time and time again. But even to that person, I would then try to give them feedback like, hey, you know, maybe instead of saying, oh, it's so tough for you to get a date because I don't believe it because you're gorgeous, maybe instead take like, like an elitist attitude and call us all peons and peasants because it might come off as like a little dark, but like a little clever, but that's just one example, right? So I was noticing um, with this dislike and like thing, like as I got older, as I got smarter, as you know, I was watching everything happening with COVID and stuff. Um, it was crazy because 
these buttons, you know, YouTube is all about Google is all about being data driven and having user generated content where the people ultimately decide what's worth watching because they know their algorithms are the best, best in class in the world where if a bunch of people like this, then a bunch of people also are going to watch this. And, you know, why try to guess what somebody's going to watch when you already know the type of things a 45 year old mother in Bangalore or Texas or Denmark, you know, enjoy and finding what all three of them would enjoy and then pushing that to the top of like the world playlist or whatever. Right. So it was weird when I saw this and then I started to notice with COVID and I am not going to go into like, is COVID right? Is it wrong? Is it blown up? Is it not? I think we all know people who have been affected by it. We all know people who also are kind of on the other sides of the fence, but I started to notice, okay, a lot of these videos, COVID related, um, you know, or people saying something that may not be in the popular narrative about, you know, gender or whatever, they were getting like huge amounts of like dislikes, right? So it seemed like on one hand, everybody had a consensus that, hey, you know, government, you're doing this thing and we don't like it or it doesn't seem right. And on the other hand, um, you know, things were kind of being uh, blocked or whatnot. And it's kind of weird, right? Because I've never sort of thought of the internet like that. I I never understood why, you know, I don't think the internet really, I don't think these big tech companies really, really care about our feelings that much. You know, I know Facebook was in the news where they knew that like Instagram was calling people um, or causing like depression in teens, but that's, that's part of growing up. You know, that's part of, I was called fat as a kid. I was called, you know, dirty Indian or 7-Eleven, get me a Slurpee. And that's what makes you an adult because you learn how to bounce things like that off of you and how to like not let people's bad comments, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones and it gives you resolve, right? But I started to notice this stuff happening. And the weird thing was, I also started to notice with the internet, there was videos that I genuinely started to like I genuinely agreed with, they seemed very rational and they seemed very well put and they were funny or informative or educational or engaging, but the dislike ratio was so high and it just seemed to me like, why are there so many dislikes when this to me, as, a, as I think I'm a normal person, seems so logical and so rational. And then I would look and I would see the people on Twitter who are commenting or I would see the people on YouTube who are commenting and they have like one comment or they have no profile or there's some like mindless account. You know, these aren't big accounts or whatnot. And then the narrative becomes, you know, for people who are too scared to go against the grain or who, or who, or who are too scared to think for themselves, then they think, okay, this guy is offensive or I don't agree with this person or, or that was a bad video or that wasn't funny. Like, have you ever wanted to share something that you totally agreed with or to, or you wanted to send it to your friends or you wanted to enjoy it, but then you start to read the comments or you start to read, see the dislikes on the video. And then you think, Oh, is, that, is there something wrong with me for finding that amusing or, or, okay. Yeah, that was offensive, you know, and that's pretty, pretty powerful, right? Because, you know, we should be able to like what we like and not like what we don't like. And, you know, I've seen this happen time and time again. I've seen it earlier with like movies. You know, I would hear all these great things about some Oscar nominated movie you got to watch or some book you got to read or some play you have to see. And it gets all this hype, you know, from the powers that be or the media or whatever. And then I watch it and I'm like, eh. I mean, it was cool. Like I wouldn't stand outside the movie theater for 17 hours to watch it again or hearing these articles or podcasts or stories about some guy who watched Star Wars 19 times. Yeah, I don't think I would do that. Um, but all that stuff gets hyped up. And then we're kind of thinking, oh, there must be something wrong with me if I don't think that. And that kind of is what really bothered me with the whole YouTube like to dislike thing, because it's like, it's okay to be spoon fed the positivity things. But when the data doesn't agree with you, you know, when people are kind of pushing back on some of these COVID restrictions, because I'm, I'm not going to deny that COVID is a bad thing, but it just doesn't make sense to me how, you know, one country next door can have everybody flying in and out to 19 different countries. And then another country can have these like arcane still lockdown restrictions, even two years later. And either it should be like across, like, how am I getting my Amazon packages and going to McDonald's every five minutes? If, if things are so, you know, um, so bad. So it's like, I totally get it. And I still wear my mask even to this day when I go out for the most part. 
Um, but it's just like, you know, oftentimes things just don't add up. And then you look at the internet and you look at the data and you just get this like weird feeling. And I've seen it time and time again. And so it, it's rough, right? Because bad news sells and good news does not sell. So if you think about like what's happening in the world, whether it's, you know, this Ukraine thing or whether it was the last year of the COVID crisis or it's politics, um, you know, like I was talking, I've never been a fan of Donald Trump, for example, right? Because obviously I grew up in poverty for the most part. I benefited from a lot more liberal things, you know, government helped me go to college and thank God, you know, because I wouldn't have been able to afford it on my own. And so I was never a fan of Trump. I didn't identify with him. He's like this crazy rich guy, has nothing in common with me. He's super opulent. And, you know, all the stuff I read about in the news of little racist, this and that. And then here in Memphis, for the first time in my life, you know, I'm around a lot more people, you know, that are African-American. I'm, I'm around a lot more typical minorities. Hell, I'm, I'm even around a lot more white people than I was used to in California. And I got my hair cut from this barber and he was African-American. And he was like, dude, like black people, we love Trump. Like a lot of us had no problem with the guy. He said what he said. You know, he didn't kind of showboat. Like he was honest about things that we liked or we didn't like. And rather than making us all these promises and paying lip service, then you just see him never do anything and whatever party that may be. But I was like, whoa, I was like, dude, you like Trump? He's like, he's like, yeah. He's like, dude, you really believe all that stuff you see on the news? Like people here. And I was like, oh, that's, that was a shock to me coming out of California. And, you know, he's got his like blade to my neck shaving. So I'm not going to argue, but that kind of opened my eyes a little bit too, because going back to, you know, we, we know what we know and we, we don't know what we don't know. Um, like it, it was kind of like, okay, I still have room to grow and I still have room. And I know me being on the liberal side, things are not perfect. And I know people who are super conservative, things are not perfect, but with the internet, things sometimes tend to be so, you know, uh, here or there binary, a zero or one, right? Where it's either you're for us or you're, or you're against us. And, and I hate that because I found myself now as I'm getting older, you know, in my late 30s, I'm kind of like, dude, like, I think I've also been drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit, a little bit. And so with the news, right? Like they, like how many times have you seen this? Like Serena Williams, you know, gets trolled on Twitter or some Bollywood actress or Hollywood actress has a movie out um, where she's playing like, like a sexually provocative, you know, character. And it's all about progression, you know, for women and their sexual identities and whatnot. And then there's like one guy who like calls her like a skank, or there's one guy who says this is not against family values. And then she pushes back and it makes like 95 headlines. Yet it's like one tweet from one account with like three people that makes all the headlines and Yahoo or CNN will be like, people are trolling Deepika Padukone or Priyanka Chopra for wearing a bikini or whatnot. And it's like, I don't think that many people were doing that. I think, well, hell, I think even a few accounts probably were created to do that. So the internet could get those clicks on the article because I read this crazy, crazy thing once that I think it was a Facebook talk or, or something else where they were saying that more people share an article without reading the article. So they just see the clickbait headline, like Deepika Padukone trolled for trying to progress, you know, sexual identity in Bangalore or India. And nobody reads the article that she wasn't really trolled or some, you know, psychiatrist just made a point about something. And, but more people just see the article and they want to just identify with, you know, where they stand on it for their clout or whatnot. So this sort of stuff, I mean, I know it's kind of a big extrapolation from, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, there's no dislikes on YouTube anymore, but I think it's a big deal because if you don't let people know, you know, what people are thinking, like we obviously have to think for ourselves, but we can't be biased right from the game because there was no comedy. So obviously I had to figure out how to improve myself and keep myself busy. So I was reading about all this stuff. And as part of that, I found out while taking a Shopify, uh, e-commerce course that, oh my goodness, it's really easy to make fake reviews on anything. Like if you want verified purchase Amazon reviews, it's super easy to send product to somebody and get them to write an authentic review. If you want, um, you know, amazing Shopify reviews that, that even have like a verified tag, all you gotta do is download some plugins and change some CSS HTML code. And I was like, wow, I don't think the average person understands this. And on the same site, it's super easy then probably, I'm assuming the same kind of click farm or the same software that can do that 
would eventually have some way to connect you to people who can do that on your YouTube comments or on your Instagram comments, even beyond what these algorithms can detect and so forth, right? And so that was fascinating to me because how many times have you guys gone to a restaurant that was like, you know, some of the best of the best food people talk about it, but you're looking at the photos and you're like, yeah, it doesn't really seem that interesting. I don't really care about steak and potatoes because, you know, we Desi is we like we Indian folks and Pakistani folks and Sri Lankan folks and Bangladeshi folks and everybody else. You know, we, we like our food with some seasoning and some spice. But like when I see, oh, there's amazing, you know, uh, beef Wellington, which I don't eat beef, but it's like amazing you know, shrimp uh, carbonara, which is actually pretty good. Um, like, I'm like, yeah, that doesn't really do it for me. But for some reason, if it's got 8,000 reviews for this restaurant, I got to go. And I do it time and time again, you know? So it's just like, I really, you know, in the last year, I've been kind of observing a lot, um, you know, and kind of trying to take back my own thought, if you will, and not thought like in the meditation sense, but kind of thoughts in the, in the like opinion sense, you know, like now when I watch the news, um, by the way, the last year also, I've been doing so much stock trading and crypto trading and investment stuff. And I'm not here trying to talk too much about that, although I will in a different episode. But um, I learned just from like spending countless hours doing that, that, oh my goodness, the news also like I can look at a stock chart and kind of understand what's really happening in the news. But then I look at the news and I'm like, wow, they're either super two, three days behind what's already happening in the financial markets, or this is all just blowing smoke because, you know, the price is going to go up, but they're acting like it's going to go down. And why would they be doing that? Oh, okay. Because, you know, they have other motives or there's other things happening. And so we're kind of in this like weird, weird intersection right now of, of technology, of personal thought of, you, you know, how to kind of manipulate the masses and kind of free thinking. And, you know, when I saw that, you know, it didn't really make a lot of news that YouTube removed the dislike button. I don't think many people cared about it. Obviously, it has practical implications. Like if you're looking for like a tutorial on like how to podcast or, you know, how to make, uh, you know, chicken curry, you obviously want to go to the videos that have more likes than dislikes and you don't want clickbait and stuff. But beyond that, I think there's a much bigger thing at play, which is, you know, you got to think for yourself, right? It's okay to go against the grain. It's okay to say, hey, I know that a restaurant had 9,000 reviews or that Amazon product says it's the top one, but yeah, I don't really dig it. You know, it wasn't really for me. And that's fine, right? Even that barber that I was telling you about, I went to some like ribs place to eat ribs. I'm not even a big rib guy, but he's like, oh, do you like it? It's like the number one in Memphis. And I was like, yeah, you know, I didn't really, it was cool, but like 9,000 reviews. I don't know. It didn't seem any different. He's like, yeah, it's kind of overrated. So I was like, whoa, like here he was like hyping it up to me in two seconds after I was honest about it. He was kind of like, yeah, I think so too. You know, so there's so much of that going on. And, you know, there's a saying in comedy and there's a saying in uh, you, most content creation and anything in life. It's like, if you're trying to be everybody, you're going to be nobody. So if all you are is following the crowd or all, you know, we all have that friend who only wants to go to the number one restaurant, only wants to go to the number one destination because all they really want to do is they want to post about it and they want to show people they're at the the best, you know, restaurant in, in Bogota or they're at the best, um, you know, beach in Greece or whatever. But I do this thing now where, you know, I think especially after marriage, because I'm just so content, you know, doing things with my wife rather than trying to like go out and meet new people. Although I love that too, where it's like, I don't want to go to the number one restaurant in Bali. I want to go to like the number seven restaurant in Bali, you know, and something funny happens when I go to the number seven restaurant in Bali and I take a picture of that smoothie bowl, like 95 people ask me like, where is that? Um, and then they have a great time and they enjoy it, even though it had a 4.1 or a 4.2, because guess what, dude, here's another thing. If some place has a 4.2, I mean, look at all of the restaurants around you. Okay. They can't all be number one. In fact, the majority of them that have 99% of the business are not number one, which means 99% of the people are not eating at the number one restaurant at any given moment. Right. And so Whenever you see a restaurant with like a 4.2, you know, I have friends like, oh, why do you want to go there? It's like a 4.2. And I was like, I want to go there because I'm telling you, it's not this like perfectly manicured fake review, you know, please everybody sort of thing. Like I want to go to a place where if you do give them attitude, they're going to give it back. Or I want to go to a place where it's so good that it can be busy sometimes. And that's why people complain that, that their food took too long and they give like one star and they bring the review down because 
you know, it's just that busy because the food is that great, right? So, I mean, come on, like most of us are eating at places that are not number one, 99% of the time, and we're doing just fine. And we love those places. I'm sure a lot of you, I'd love a lot of you to do this. Like think about your favorite restaurant going up in your neighborhood. And in my neighborhood in California, a place called Thai Basil, they're like a 3.9 or like a 4.2. They're not a 4.8, you know, but I love it. I will always go there. As long as they're open, I will be going there. So you know, it's, uh, I kind of rambled a little bit, but please forgive me. I was a bit off on a, a tangent, uh, this time, but I'm just, I'm just telling you, like, as you see things online, you know, don't kind of, you know, I think the, the millennials call it be a cuck or whatever. Right. Um, you know, don't kind of just follow the herd, learn to question things, learn to think for yourself and don't be afraid. I mean, don't troll people unless, you know, they deserve to, I mean, don't even troll people anyways, but but don't be afraid to, to disagree with something, you know, and there are even in people who are famous or who have clout, when they get criticism, they block people on Twitter and they're just a bit too, you know, soft that way or OCD that way or whatever it is. And that's fine. You know, everybody's got their own um, kind of thing, but just don't be so gullible, right? Because it's, I'm telling you, like, you're going to wake up at like 40 or 50 years old and all you ever did was agree with everything watch all the news that you were supposed to do and not question anything. And you're probably going to be a little upset, right? <laughs> because, you know, you never challenged yourself to think outside the box. Or you never challenged yourself, uh, you know, like, you know, I used to read these books. I, I didn't really read them, but I know a lot of guys probably listening did where when we were growing up, there was books called like The Game or there was like, you know, how to be a player or how to like approach women. And what do those guys say? They, they said a lot of BS, you know, which is like, you know, be crazy or insult the girls or whatnot. But I think that the key point was try to be different, right? Try to stand out, you know, try to be noticeable, try to, you know, in in, in this world that we live in right now, you know, having a personality is your wingman, right? Like differentiating is your wingman. Being creative is your wingman. Like, fine, you're something more conventional, like a doctor, a lawyer, a business analyst, a computer science guy. That's cool. But, but have an edge, you know, have something that differentiates you because ultimately, you know, education also is going to get commoditized because there's going to be a million people who can now learn computer science. There's going to be a million people now who can, you know, learn medicine a lot easier and take the MCATs or take the USMLEs because they have free education on YouTube or whatnot, right? So all of this kind of comes full circle in the sense of as you guys go out there in the world, you know, as you go out there uh, feeling challenged or feeling upset or getting triggered by stuff, just remember, dude, it's kind of like a big game sometimes. And the people, you know, who, what does Steve Jobs say? The people who are crazy to challenge the world do or whatever on a smaller note at the very least just stop being um you know a yes man a yes woman to everything like recognize that there is a place for likes and dislikes and it's okay for you to not like everything don't hate everything but um don't get kind of spoon fed uh everything being everything so bad or so good you know it's crazy dude like even google the most powerful company in the world um you know, they said, uh, you know, their slogan was do no evil. Um, and then I, I Googled, I Googled this area. I Googled Google's slogan line. Say that five, Google Google's slogan line five times. Their, their slogan or mission statement went from do no evil um, to do the right thing. Um, and even Google, the most powerful company in the world, realize that, yeah, they, they can't do no evil. You know, there's always going to be good and bad from both sides of people. There's going to be great people who try to do good things, but ultimately do bad things. And there, there's going to be bad people, you know, uh, maybe who do bad things that end up potentially becoming good things. Who knows? Right. So anyways, um, really long, uh, stretch from the dislike button, but I think, you know what I'm saying? And, and it's really helped me, kind of find my own in comedy so I have a voice, but it's really helped me kind of like kind of understand what I'm about and the things that kind of bother me and don't bother me. Um, and, and I've learned once you kind of, once you kind of start thinking for yourself, whether it's in finance or medicine or stock trading or comedy or business or mental health or whatnot, or eating at a restaurant, whatever it might be, you start to kind of see through the fog and things start to become a lot more clearer. It, it's weird, right? The people who are trying to show you everything transparently are the ones actually kind of blinding you 
because they're giving you everything. You know, um, I read this thing a long time ago that it used to be censorship is not withholding. Sorry, censorship used to be withholding information. Now it's too much information. So, you know, don't be censored. Don't censor yourself. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, hearing what you guys think about that. But remember, it's okay to like stuff. It's okay to dislike stuff. Um, it's okay to have an opinion. And it's okay to not be part of the majority because that's how you're going to be one in a million, right? So I appreciate you guys and I will see you next week. Birdie num num. Birdie num num. Birdie num num. Yeah.